morning and welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital assets. I'm your host, Jen Sinanti, here with my co-host, Coindesk regulatory reporter, Amitaj Singh. Amitaj, wonderful, wonderful to see you again. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, it's lovely to see you. We used to have breakfast together in Austin. Uh, that was when a long time back. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> it was a long time back. I know. And now we're just virtual. I guess it is what it is. All right. Let's let's talk about what's happening in the crypto news this morning. FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed is heading into court for an arraignment. We'll speak with a lawyer in just a moment about what's happening there. But first, let's take a look at the markets, starting with Bitcoin. The Coindesk Bitcoin price XBX index is at 26,057, up about 0.2%, really steadying after that liquidation event late last week. Let's see if Ether is following suit. The Coindesk Ether price ETX index is at 1,663. And the DFX Coindesk's DeFi index is at about 101 points. All right, let's take a look at our top story this morning. Thailand's government is giving Facebook parent company Meta a new warning. The country's Minister of Digital Economy and Society told the social media giant to curb the number of fraudulent crypto investment scams being advertised on the site or risk being expelled for the country. Amitage, it feels like Facebook's battle against governments is one that is never ending and maybe for good reason. But uh, what are your thoughts on the story? Yeah, I mean, you know, we see this again and again in different forms. We've seen it with disinformation. First, it was misinformation, then it became disinformation, and in the middle was Cambridge Analytica, right? And what we're seeing right now is uh, Facebook once again grappling with uh, being uh, a dominant force of social media that is basically omnipresent. It's just everywhere. Uh, and if you have a platform that is basically serving almost, well, what is it? 30 to 40 percent of the world's population then how do you control what is on those platforms with just a handful of employees they have offices in east asia in in dublin and of course in menlo park and they have these war rooms where one of us have actually i've actually gone there and seen the efforts they make in trying to you know cull this misinformation but What's happening again and again, and it's happened in India and other parts of the world, including the US, where the governments reach out to Facebook and say, well, there's misinformation being posted on your website. In this case, it's basically crypto scammers who are putting stuff out. And in this case, more than 300,000 cases, 200,000 victims, uh, 10,000 million baht. So it is just something that happens again and again. Just think about it. You post something on Facebook, Facebook needs some time to take it down. And in that time, the damage is done and there's just so many people on Facebook's timelines that it's impossible almost and that's that's something that's going to be tricky so they're going to just I think what's going to happen is that Thailand is going to bring Facebook officials into their offices tell them the problem you know bring the hammer down on them and then Facebook officials will divert a lot of their resources to Thailand try to fix that problem you know fix their algorithms and then maybe we'll see some change. My hope is that if that does happen Amitaj that the good information about crypto, the good information that comes from the industry stays and they don't just throw the good out with the bad, which can often happen in these cases. All right, let's, let's take a turn to the state of crypto now. The state of crypto is presented by Tron, connecting the world to the power of cryptocurrency. Sam Bankman Freed is back in the legal hot seat. The FTX founder is getting arraigned this morning on the most recent version of his indictment. Joining us now to discuss is former federal prosecutor and partner at Brian Cave Leighton Paisner, Renato Mariotti. Welcome to the show, Renato. Happy to be here. Thanks. Good morning. We are happy to have you here. All right. Tell us what's going on this morning. What are you expecting to see in this arraignment? Well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, this is going to be an interesting peek at Sam Bankman Freed after he's been in prison. Um, remember that he was repeatedly violating his conditions of release. Uh, he had the bright idea that he was going to be 
trying to get his retaliation against witnesses and so on, and the judge has put him in prison. So it's going to be interesting. There, there, there should be a fight at this court appearance over his communications and his, uh, with his lawyers, his lawyers' access to him. That has been an ongoing issue that his lawyers have been raising. They want to have more time with him to prepare for trial. They want days where he can be at their office. They want uninterrupted hours with him. And then separately, um, there will be you know some discussion soon about jury instructions. Um, there is, a, I'd say, a very uh, traditional, typical fight here between the defendant and the government about jury instructions. Um, unfortunately for Mr. Bankman Freed, um, he is facing a lot of counts, even without this count that has been um, you know, dismissed uh, for now uh, due to the uh, extradition treaty with the Bahamas. So obviously there's a lot we don't know right now, and the proceeding is currently ongoing. Uh, he was with his defense uh, you know, lawyers uh, for the last hour or so preparing for this arraignment. Now the arraignment is going to happen, and then he's going to go back with the defense lawyers to prepare for his defense uh, for the next five hours or so, we, we think, uh, depending on how long the arraignment goes on. I just want to understand, given the fact that you work for the U.S. Attorney's Office and were assigned, <laughs> interestingly, to the Securities and Commodities Fraud Section at the time, you charged and convicted just several violators. Is there a precedence for a person charged to be let out of jail five days a week, even if it is in the attorney's office, to prepare for his defense? Does that happen? It, it, it does happen in a complex case. I do think it's fair to say that the judge is giving uh, extra accommodation to Mr. Bankman Freed, and it's being done because the judge does not want to try this case a second time and doesn't want to deal with issues on appeal. In other words, let's just say that the judge made a decision. Judge Kaplan said, you know, we're going to re heavily restrict the amount of time that you spend with your attorneys. Um, what's gonna, what would happen is after the trial, Mr. Bankman Freed would challenge the verdict claiming that he did not have adequate time to prepare, he was not properly afforded his right to counsel. And so good judges anticipate this. They only want to try the case once. They don't want to deal with lengthy appeals. And so they're accommodating to the defense of uh, pretrial, um, particularly in a case like this where the, the evidence is overwhelming. I expect the judge thinks this is likely going to be a conviction. And it's a complex case that the judge really doesn't want to have to try uh, more than one time. All right. Okay. Uh you know, a follow-up here, because the other thing that's happening is that uh, he's going to go with an approach. Uh, the defense is going to go with an approach which is potentially going to reveal the lawyer who gave him the advice to do what he did. You know, uh, the that, 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 that leads to this problem of a particular lawyer or lawyers who will be suddenly in the limelight if their names are allowed out, I suppose. Uh, yeah. What do you what do you make of that? The advice of counsel defense that SPF is going to use, uh, you know, including the identification of the attorney. That's something that's been demanded by the U.S. attorney. Uh, that if you are going to take that, then I need to know well in advance before we go into the case and what that could really mean. Because you know, this is he said, she said kind of thing. Eventually, yeah. Regarding the advice of counsel defense. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know that meme on the internet. It's a bold move, Cotton. Uh, let's see if it works out for him. Uh, I think it's a very bold move. It's a, sort of a Hail Mary, um, but it, it has a lot of pitfalls. Uh, one of which is that he, w once he identifies the attorney, he is required to waive attorney-client privilege, and the government will have the opportunity to ask questions and inquire regarding his communications with that attorney. Uh, that often works against the defendant because it's rarely the case that uh, a defendant asks for advice about committing a crime and the lawyer, in a straightforward way, without a bunch of caveats or, um, or uh, other, uh, other legal, uh, legalisms, says, yes, you should go forward and commit a crime. That's a great idea. I expect... When you look at those communications, they're not going to read the way that Sam Bankman Freed wants them to read. And in my experience, when lawyers are brought on the stand, and I've been in that position when I was a federal prosecutor, uh, you know, cross examining a lawyer in an advice of counsel defense, the lawyer buried the defendant. 
Why? Because the lawyer has his own reputation and, of course, is not going to suggest or say that in any way he was counseling someone to commit fraud. Renato, you know, we saw Sam Bankman fried out on bail at his parents' house, limited communications. Now he's being accused of tampering with witnesses. He's back behind the behind bars. In your opinion, is his defense team doing a good job so far? Yes. The problem with the Sam Bankman defense, uh, Freed defense team is not the lawyers. It's Sam Bankman Freed. He is really um, making wrong, very bad choices for himself. From his media blitz, uh, where he was talking to everyone under the sun, um, essentially giving the prosecutors a free crack at him, uh, they, they can use those statements against him in trial, to um, you know, his vendetta against, for example, his former paramour, Ms. Ellison, who will be testifying against him in trial, and his other shenanigans uh, while he was on release. Uh, he really made a lot of bad choices, and he only has himself to blame for the predicament that he's in. I, I really don't blame his attorneys at all. I think particularly given the resources, the limited resources he has, I think he has, you know, re reputable attorneys. I think the issue is Mr. Bankman freed himself. You know, Renato, I want to push back against what you said, because the bottom line is that these lawyers agreed to work with him. And when they agree to work with a particular client, you tell the client that you don't do anything I don't want you to do. And clearly, the lawyers were not either, you know, convincing enough for SPF, or there is that alternative theory that you're putting out there that he's just, you know, somebody who goes uh, wild. Uh, so, yeah, what about that? Uh, that's a fair point. Uh, they did agree to this. Um, I feel a little bit uh, an analogy might be to Donald Trump, right, who uh, has many lawyers who I imagine tell him to comply with rules, but he goes and does and says what he wants anyway. Uh, he's not, uh, you know, he's not someone who's easy for lawyers to control. Look, I represent clients across the country all the time. I've been uh, out, of, uh, out of the government now for several years. Um, and I have my own share of clients who don't follow my instructions. Uh, I've represented politicians myself who will, uh, you know, want the limelight and answer questions from reporters and uh, take interviews, even though I tell them that's a really bad idea while you're under criminal investigation. So I, I do feel his lawyer's pain um, and don't blame them for that. Yes, they did sign on for this. Um, yes, they are probably uh, not going to get paid with their worth, and they're going to have to deal with a client who doesn't follow their instructions. Um, so, but I, I do think uh, I, I put the blame here with the client because I can't imagine any competent lawyer not heavily warning this client, uh, as he was frankly warned by the judge in court, that everything he says can be used against him, and uh, that's exactly what's going to happen. Renato, speaking of following instructions that DOJ and Sam Bankman fried have filed, competing sets of jury instructions for the trial in October. Talk to us about what's going on here. Is this usual? Yeah, it's pretty commonplace. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the Sam Bankman fried case really looks a lot like other large fraud cases. Um, and when I was fighting large fraud cases uh, myself, when I was a, a federal prosecutor, uh, I would have big fights over jury instructions, uh, in, including the one that, um, you know, that it, there's a big fight about right now. You know, Sam Bankman-Fried wants to include what's called a good faith instruction. Defendants often want to include a good faith instruction. And basically what the good faith instruction says is that if the defendant was acting in good faith, he did not have the intent to defraud, which is one of the elements that the government has to prove in order to prove his guilt. So it's in some, you know, the government will argue it's repetitive, it's not necessary, the, the instructions already say we have to prove intent to defraud, but judges routinely give that to the defense uh, because they want to make sure there's no issue on appeal. Same reason I mentioned regarding, uh, you know, uh, what, why, uh, why he's given time to, um, you know, to, um, uh, with, to uh, work with his lawyers, and what I just what I will just expect there ultimately is for the government to win. Um, you know that there, excuse me, for the defense to win that fight as well. All right, uh, you know you're already in the hot seat, but I'm going to make it hotter. Uh, here's the thing: hypothetically, if you're given only one choice, which is that you have to predict an outcome for this case right now, 
and you know nobody's going to hold you to it because obviously this is just discussion and speculation what would that outcome be Sam Bankman Freed will be guilty on most but not all counts in other words uh, the jury's facing a lot of different counts are to select uh, not you know not guilty for everything um, and the, the evidence is pretty damning um, so I'll, I'll expect him to get a, you know to be found guilty on most counts which by the way is a complete and utter defeat the fact that he gets a, a, a not guilty on a few counts uh, is irrelevant because he'll be uh, guilty of many felonies and will ultimately receive a very lengthy sentence. And lastly, Renato, I got to ask you, because we've asked almost every lawyer who's been on this show weighing in on the Sam Bankman-Fried case, and I hope that one day we'll make a, an epic compilation of it. What advice would you give Sam Bankman-Fried right now if you were his lawyer? Shut up. Um, stop talking. <laughs> Um, stop doing, you know, stop doing anything that your lawyers don't do. It's time to take this seriously and realize that you're not the smartest guy in the room. You never were. Uh, and it's time to follow the experts' advice and try to help them save your life. Renato, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. That was Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner partner, Renato Mariotti. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take a deep dive into the crypto markets as Bitcoin holds firm around $26,000. Stick around. Good morning and welcome back to First Mover. Bitcoin is holding around $26,000, but our crypto traders bracing for more volatility yet again. Let's find out. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is ETC Group Chief Strategy Officer Bradley Duke. Welcome to the show, Bradley. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin. You shared a chart showing Bitcoin's recent massive liquidations that happened late last week. Uh, unpack what's going on here for us. Well, so we came out of a period of about eight weeks where Bitcoin was trading um, between thirty-one thousand and twenty-nine thousand uh, dollars, and that was that was really a, a, a period which was of, of low volatility for Bitcoin, which was particularly uh, unusual. Um, and then, you know, with with uh, some negative macro news uh, last week, there was a, a sell-off, which was exacerbated greatly by liquidation of some. 
855 million in long uh, long positions. So leverage long positions um, were, uh, were were liquidated as part of this this price fall, which made the the price fall even greater. But as you, as you mentioned, since then we've seen. Uh, Bitcoin stabilized around 26,000, and that's where it's been over the weekend and uh, and, and into the, the early part of this week. What macro oh. news are are you following? I guess when it comes to the impact on Bitcoin's price, you know we have rising um, inflation, the potential to rise rates again here in the U.S. There's news coming out of China. There've been a bunch of different reasons given for the volatility in recent crypto markets, but which which one are are you particularly following? Well, I'm, I'm following actually both of those. I think the uh, the sort of negative uh, sentiment on the, the economy in China is definitely one that a lot of uh, economists are watching very, very closely. Um, and of course, the, the the notes that that were coming out of the the, the Fed and, and at a recent uh, uh, speech, whereby there was a, a clear indication that it's likely that higher rates are here for longer than than was previously expected, uh, certainly helped um, tank markets on that day. All right. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why it uh, crossed 30K Bitcoin was because of uh, the excitement around spot Bitcoin ETFs and Ether ETFs. Uh, and you're kind of an expert on that, but on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you guys launched the first centrally uh, cleared Bitcoin exchange traded product on Deutsche Börse Zetra, the largest ETF trading venue in Europe, and have also launched Europe's first metaverse ETF. So. Uh, why has that uh, not been like that? The momentum of that expectation has it dipped, or has inflation and these macro conditions just been too important for uh, for the traders? I think a bit of both. I think, you know, there's been a, a flurry of activity in the applications, both for Bitcoin and, uh, as we've seen recently, for uh, Ethereum uh, futures-based uh, ETFs as well. Um, and, and 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 I guess from the, the perspective of the SEC, they don't want to be uh, seen as king maker. I think it's problematic for them to be a king maker. Um, so it's more than likely that they will approve a bunch of those uh, ETFs altogether. Um, and so, but then the question is, there's a kind of a feeling that this is it's going to just this is going to happen, but then when? And I feel that there was probably uh, a feeling that this isn't imminent, but will more than likely be uh, happening probably Q1 next year. So pushed out a little bit that maybe some some people thought. But I think the, the, there's no doubt that the the negative macro sentiment that that came through last week was also one of the contributing factors. So I just want to push back on this because it's not clear. And, and I, you know, you've got it right, obviously, in Europe. And the SEC's position has been completely different from whatever's happening in Europe. Yet right. people continue to say this is going to happen. You know, this is likely to happen. And nobody is yeah. really giving a strong answer to the question, why? Why is it likely to happen? Why is it the SEC is actually just going to turn around and say, well, no, we're okay with it. We're going to actually just give a green light to all of you. Together, that too. Uh, there's a grayscale, grayscale lawsuit happening. That's the spot Bitcoin conversation. But the ETF conversation has more confidence around it. The Ether ETF converse, conversation, I beg your pardon. So I'm just trying to understand, like, do you have an answer to why? Like, why would they actually, like, you know, agree? And, and allow these yeah, I, I, look, I think when when we saw uh, BlackRock um, making filing their their application and getting that ap application uh, a, a approved, um, uh, that that was a signal to to the market that something has changed. I, I, I don't know about the back, you know, the backroom dealings of of the SEC and what is said behind closed doors uh, to. You know, incredibly powerful players like um, you know BlackRock uh, and, and and others, but it seems that their entry signaled the fact that there has been a softening of position. I, I would love it for there to be greater clarity and greater transparency in the in the, the workings of the SEC and the, especially in this area. Uh, I find it quite murky and, and quite difficult. Uh, it's very very different from the European regulatory uh, environment, which is has got different kinds of problems, but I think the transparency is, is, is something that's, that's greater uh, in Europe. Is expecting the markets to move on an ETF approval almost too much of a US-centric viewpoint? Like Amitaj mentioned, these ETFs exist in other places in the world. Like, Do you feel like maybe these ETFs are going to be approved and the market's maybe not going to move as much as we think it, it should? 
I think that's an interesting question. And I, I think one can't discount the fact, you know, the, the US is the largest um, uh, economy in the world and uh, and, and the, the investment community there are certainly they, the, the more sophisticated and, and, and larger investors will invest all around the world. But the fact that there is a U, US-based uh, spot uh, Bitcoin ETF, I, I certainly think is going to uh, allow, it's going to facilitate the flow of uh, a, a lot of new money into Bitcoin that previously wasn't there because people haven't really liked the structure of the futures-based products. Uh, well, don't like it as much as the as a spot product, um, and and also there's a lot of people out there who are not who don't really want to get into the nuts and bolts of how blockchain works and you know being their own bank and and holding their own you know uh, private key, um, and and so this kind of ETF uh, structure really is an enabler, allowing um, more access uh, to to Bitcoin uh, than and, and than uh, than being without it. Um, and so I think I think there definitely will be uh, a, a price um, increase. I don't know. We don't know how large or what, you know, what it will be or how small. But I, I certainly think that as simply by the fact that it's enabling uh, more access to Bitcoin, uh, there will be a, a, a upward price pressure. Just uh, tell us a little bit about what you think about what's happening with the stablecoin market, because something big happened. Coinbase acquired a minority stake in Circle uh, Internet uh, Financial. And I say this in the context of the fact that in just about two weeks from now, maybe three, uh, we are expecting uh, the FSB and the IMF, uh, the Financial Stability Board and the International Monetary Fund to come up with their own uh, well global standard around stablecoins and crypto regulations, but particularly stablecoin, where there has been a difference between the advanced G7 economies and the emerging G20 economies and the global south in general. Uh, so Coinbase is going to, you know, has, has obviously like acquiring, acquired this minority stake, which is going to give it a fill up in the stablecoin market. But there is also going to be this regulation that comes in a few weeks later that's going to be like, no, wait, we're not that confident about stablecoins because they disrupt our economies. <sighs> Right. Well, look, I think I think it's quite interesting. The uh, I read with interest the the, the Coinbase story, um, and you know, as you know, the two the, the two largest incumbents, USDC and USDT, uh, have been challenged recently by PayPal um, in terms of uh, you know they they announced that they were entering into the stablecoin market. Uh, certainly, that's something that you have to sit up and take notice when PayPal is moving because they are a very well established and well respected brand, and they have enormous amount of experience in international payments and remittance uh, so so I think this this area is, is hotting up what what that actually means and you know what the new regulation means in terms of how these players will be able to compete going forward uh, I think I'd, I'd be very interested to see the 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 substance uh, of, of the of the regulation um, before I make make a call but it's certainly there is certainly a massive revenue opportunity with stable coins, especially given the yield that can be uh, that can be earned from from deposits, uh, you know, and treasuries and, and, and other risk free um, uh, bonds, etc. That government bonds. Um, that that this is definitely going to be an area where there's going to be a, a huge passing up of uh, competition. Bradley, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. That was ETC Group Chief Strategy Officer Bradley Duke. All right, we are about to go to break, but first, some breaking news. Sam Bankman fried has pled not guilty to fraud and money laundering charges tied to the collapse of his crypto empire FTX last year. During a court appearance, we'll continue to monitor the developments and keep you updated. We're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, asset tokenization firm Securitize acquires a digital asset wealth platform. We'll speak to the CEO right after this.
Welcome back to First Mover. Asset tokenization firm Securitize is buying digital asset wealth platform OnRamp Invest to grow its offering to registered investment advisors. This is, of course, known as RIAs. Joining us now is Securitize CEO Carlos Domingo. Welcome, Carlos. Hi, good morning, and thanks for having me in the show again. It's our pleasure. How much uh, did you purchase on Ram Invest for, and what are the terms of the transaction getting right there? <laughs> <laughs> Come to discuss the terms of the transaction. Uh, so you already know that that part. But I have to say we're very excited about the the acquisition. We we had partnered with them since early this year, so we actually got to know the company uh, quite well. And then you know, looking at uh, you guys know how the market it is is. It's tough for companies to, to raise money and some smaller companies like Unwrap, they decided that they're better off being part of a bigger organization and entity where, where they can thrive and, and have uh, you know proper funding without having to go out to, to the outside market. Um, so we you know had the opportunity of uh, bringing them in-house and uh, we thought it was a very good idea. As you know, the IRA channel is very important. It's huge. It's $100 trillion uh, of wealth being managed there that is very poorly served by anything related to digital assets or digital asset securities. So we thought it was a very good opportunity. You know, the, the funny thing is that uh, we've had, uh, we were just talking about SPF, uh, and he kind of let down the entire industry and perhaps the world, and then led to a trust deficit for the entire industry because of him. And, you know, uh, and in that context, I just wanted to ask the question again. You don't have to share how much you purchased on ramp for, but perhaps give us the tidbits of the crumbs of some terms of the transaction at least. <laughs> Well, so the the transaction uh, hasn't closed yet. By the way, we signed the the purchase agreement. We're expecting to close it uh, this week. Uh, on Ram comes with uh, uh, thirteen employees. They currently have connected in their platform uh, a number of IRAs that collectively manage around uh, forty billion dollars. So it's a very big opportunity because forty billion dollars is a very 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 small percentage of the IRA channel which, as I mentioned, is uh, estimated to be around $100 trillion in, in the U.S. and keeps growing around 10-12% per, per year. So I think that uh, expanding on, on the basis of what they built uh, on their tech platform is a, is a massive opportunity for us. What does expansion look like for you from here? Any more acquisitions on the horizon? We always look for acquisitions. I think that when markets... Are depressed as now and then VC funding has dried up and there is a lot of companies that raised money in 2021 when valuations were obviously much higher and as you've seen public markets valuations have dramatically uh, declined as interest rates have been going up and the, the same corrections haven't happened in private markets but I think they're coming as people are running out of money so I think that uh, inorganic growth is something that we always keep an eye on it's not our first one so we acquire a company in Japan already we acquire uh, our broker dealer we acquire a transfer agent this is our fifth acquisition so it's something that we always look at uh, as a way to inorganically growth to take advantage of the momentum in the industry. Let's talk about real world assets. You know, you're talking about the kind of depression in the markets, the consolidation. Do you feel like firms that are focused on these real world assets haven't been hit as hard by what's been happening in, in the industry and outside, like um, if we were to consider inflation, for example? I think so. So look, um, the, I think crypto goes, uh, you know, back and forth between different narratives. So tokenization was something that six years ago when we started in the space and, and subsequently started the company it was supposed to be a big thing. And it, it has been growing fairly slowly uh, compared to the more unregulated side of crypto. But I think that last year, you know, debacles in, in many companies, you guys just talk about FTX and SBF, but that was not the only one. I mean, you have Celsius, BlockFi, uh, Voyager, like there's so many companies that, um, you know, went out of business. And I think people in crypto have realized that now it's time to, to go back at looking at doing productive things with blockchain and taking real world assets and make them more productive because they are natively digitized on chain. And that's what we've been, uh, you know, trying to do for the last few years. And I think there is also, you know, a, a different market situation where companies like us have basically over the years uh, acquired the necessary licenses to operate in, in a world that is obviously regulated uh, from the get-go because real world assets for the most part are you know securities and therefore they're regulated so i think that this is the time that we're going to see uh, growth in the industry and we've already seen it and uh, as you said you know maybe 
the market has impacted less, but the reputational impact is there as well, right? Like a lot of people see all this fraud happening in crypto. Sometimes they don't distinguish between some parts of the market and some other parts of the market. But hopefully we'll pass uh, this and, uh, and growth is uh, ahead of us. I was curious to ask you about that, actually, because, you know, we've, we've seen how uh, it's, a, it's kind of difficult for, for perhaps niche uh, companies uh, in, in this space to decouple themselves from the credibility crisis it faces right now. And what you're doing is tokenizing securities and that too, you know, in other parts of the world also. So, like, how does, how does that play out? Uh, because there is the U.S. market and the global market. There is headwinds against something unique that you are trying to do. How do you, how do you manage it? How do you keep, keep doing it? So first and foremost, we're very committed to the U.S. market. We understand it's a tough market because the regulatory environment is uh, stricter and tougher and more complex, if you want. But at the end of the day, the U.S. is the largest world economy. But if you look at the, what they represent in terms of capital markets, it's actually 40 percent of all capital markets. So, so ignoring the U.S. and going to smaller geographies only to try to operate from there. I don't think that this is a long-term viable solution for anybody in the space. That said, we're also looking at other large uh, jurisdictions like Europe. Uh, Europe has recently passed very comprehensive regulation for both digital assets and digital asset securities. We obviously play on the, on the second uh, part of the space. So we are applying for the DLT pilot regime. And recently we announced that in Europe, we have done the first you know, trial tokenization tests on a public blockchain on Avalanche um, as part of this, uh, you know, sandbox environment where we are, that we are hoping to emerge with a full license to operate at the end of this year. All right, Carlos, we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining the show this morning. Thanks for having me again. That was Securitized CEO Carlos Domingo. All right, we're going to turn to some of Amatosha's reporting now. One of India's most prominent crypto exchanges is feeling the brunt of crypto winter. Uh, Amatosh, you've been watching the developments closely. India has had kind of a turbulent experience uh, with crypto. First, that 30% tax, then that 1% tax that I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that exchanges are responsible for on every transaction. Um, talk to us about what's going on in India as it relates to crypto. Paint a picture. What's it like there? Are people adopting crypto? Are they afraid of it? Have these new rules deterred uh, folks? I think it's important to just start by saying that of the population in the world, India is the largest. Uh, does that mean it's got the most number of traders? Well, not necessarily. Uh, the money comes from the US. We know that. But India is in incredibly important. And I'd say for two reasons. Uh, one is its sheer population strength, uh, and and two, it's the G20 uh, presidency that it holds right now. So it's kind of steering anything to do with global rules around crypto. I'll come to that in a bit. But what's happened right now is that a cascading effect, domino effect that's taken place in uh, in India since February 1, 2022, when during the budget, the finance minister of India announced uh, taxes, very stiff taxes, two in particular, 30% taxes on profit and 1% tax deducted at source on every single transaction. Now that really, you know, it, it took uh, it took the wind out of whatever, uh, you know, momentum the crypto industry had, had, had got at that time. Uh, and as a result of that, there was a crypto brain drain and anyone who wanted to start up a company was moving to Singapore or Dubai. And then, you know, there was a shadow ban before that. So it, it was an industry that uh, was, was finally getting going. And then suddenly it was, you know, the legs under it were taken away. Uh, local payment processes were cut off. Uh, we did a story a few weeks back, actually. We looked at some of the best or most prominent exchanges in India. We looked at whether they had cash uh, to do business, what their runway looked like. And we found uh, that most of them had one to four years and Coin DCX, which has kind of like taken the lead along with uh, maybe uh, uh, CoinSwitch, uh, which is another exchange uh, after Vazirex and Binance got into a feud. Uh, so what Coin DCX was doing was trying to reach out to regulators of finance ministry and anyone who's willing to listen and bring them onto the table to have that conversation, which was kind of impossible in India because of the taboo that crypto had, had got because the central bank RBI Reserve Bank of India had said, well, they just banned the thing. And they continue to say that at, at G20 meetings. We reported about that. Now, the second aspect is the G20 thing, which is that under the presidency, India is effectively going to be holding the leaders as meet. Joe Biden will be there. Anyone who's anyone <laughs> amongst the top economies in the world, they'll be there. Um, 
And effectively, India will go out there and say, well, we got everyone together. We decided that we want to make crypto global regulation consensus building a priority. And we're going we're gonna to put it out there with the help of the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, and the IMF. A synthesis paper will come out. Now, what that will say, we kind of already know. It's been reported by my colleague Jack Schickler and myself. Uh, but India is not going to come up with its own regulation. And the uncertainty is going to continue. They have kind of made up their mind. Sources did tell us that. And as a result of that, the uncertainty for these exchanges continues. And they just have to kind of like just manage. And, and that's what they're doing. We did go to CoinDCX's office in Bengaluru, which is the IT capital of India, uh, just a few weeks back. And we did meet their people. And we did not at that time have a sense that this would happen. All right, Amitaj. Um, for our audience who wants to read up more about your reporting, you can do that on coindesk.com. That was a great preview. Thank you for that. And that's it for First Mover today. I'm Jen Sanasi. Thank you to Amitaj Singh, my co-host. Don't miss uh, Coindesk's next next crypto in the macro spaces coming up at 10 a.m. Eastern time after Bitcoin and Ether fell over 10% last week after a prolonged period of low volatility. That's on X. Of course, X is formerly known as Twitter. First Mover returns tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, you can catch the hash at noon. You're watching Coindesk TV.